Hey math fans, so last time we discussed this quantity called a combination, which is the number of subpopulations of size r that you can draw from a population of size n. And we worked an example where we use this. This is one of the possible notations for it, uh, and you might sometimes see uh, n choose r. So from n total, we're choosing r. Well, today I'm going to start off by giving you an alternative way to view uh, this factor right here. And that view is the following. So uh, from theorem 1.3, we have that, and this is gonna be slightly different, but the number of ways to divide a population to divide a population of size n into two groups of size, we'll say r and size n minus r is the same thing. Okay. So curiously enough, this idea of combinations and, and subpopulations also applies to splitting a population up into two sections, usually those that have an attribute that you're interested in and those that don't. So maybe if you only have two different kinds of marbles, red and green, and you want the probability of having like, of drawing five red marbles, you can split the population up into red marbles and those that are not red. Okay, so this is an interesting application of this formula. And the thing that I wanted to point out is that R and N minus R, in order for this to be valid, they both have to add up. So these both have to add up to N. Okay, and this kind of talks about the idea of something called a partition. So the idea of a partition is that you have N different objects or elements in a population, and you essentially split up the population into sections, okay? And so far, we've only done two sections, but in the next theorem, we'll discuss multiple sections with two properties. The first property is that the sum of all these sections has to add up to the total population N, okay? And the second criterion is that these have to be mutually exclusive. There's no overlap between the sections in your partition. Okay, so the idea is that this might be R and this might be N minus R. And what we have here is a population of size N that is partitioned. The reason I use that word is because mathematically it means kind of the same thing as I described it, partitioned into two, you can call them groups, call them subpopulations. And remember a partition, again, just means that the two subpopulations add up to the total population and there's no overlap between the subpopulations. I'm not going to write that down because it's not the most important you know what a partition is right now. But I just want you to get the general idea. So the question is, what if you wanted or even needed to partition a population into multiple, meaning more than two groups or subpopulations. How do you count whenever it's not just one or the other? Okay, so maybe you have a population with, you know, a couple of stars here, 
couple of squares there and, and maybe a bunch of dots here and you want to break it up like this. So how do you do that? How do you count the numbers? Well, that's gonna be theorem 1.4. And the reason that I worded it, worded theorem 1.3 in this way, the number of ways to divide a population into two groups of R and N minus R, is because I want you to connect this formula with the one I'm about to show you, because it's gonna look very similar. Okay. So let N1, N2, all the way up to NK be we'll say the numbers, the number of elements in subpopulations that partition a population of size n. Okay, so in other words, if we look at our example up here, in the language that I just described, maybe N1 here would be three, N2 would be two, and here N3 would be four, because the combined total of all the, of the entire population would have nine elements. Okay, so N, big N, would just equal nine. Okay, so it's just the number of elements in each of those subpopulations that make up the total population. Okay, in that case, so we have, of course, the N1 plus N2 all the way up to NK equals N, and we also have no overlap. Then, the number of ways to partition the population into these K subpopulations is given by the following formula of sizes N1, N2, NK specifically. So into these K subpopulations sizes N1, N2, NK is this formula. Little n divided by N1 factorial, N2 factorial, times dot 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 all the way to NK factorial. Okay. I'm gonna highlight this. And let me just explain. So up here, when I partition this into three elements here, two elements there, and four elements there, that is not the only way to partition those nine elements into groups of three, two, and four, okay? I could have, for example, done three here, could have done three there, two there, and four there. But I partitioned it into that way specifically because I'm trying to group all of elements of one type together, all elements of another type together, and so on. But you can really, there are many different ways to partition a population into groups of sizes like that. And it's that many times. Now again, I want you to connect the fact that here, all of these all of these numbers they all add to big N which is how I honestly remember this formula okay n1 plus n2 all the way plus nk adds up to n which is how you know that you have a partition in the first place 
Okay, now I'm not going to prove this formula. It's really just an extension. This is an extension of theorem 1.3 that uses like blocks and blocks of, of combinations in the formula and a little bit of induction. Uh, so instead I'm just gonna move on and, and we're gonna discuss some examples. Okay, uh, first example is not really gonna involve this formula. The next one will. Okay, so let's start with an example. Here's our first example for today. It says, what is the probability that two playing cards picked at random from a full deck are both aces? Okay, so recall that a full deck of cards is 52. We want the probability that we draw two playing cards and they're both aces, which is not very likely by the way. But let's go ahead and do this. So let's let the event A be drawing two aces two aces. And then how many ways can this occur? Well, there are four aces in total, right? So of the four aces, of the four aces, we are choosing to draw two of them. Okay. So when we're talking about the number of ways A can occur, you're, you're essentially splitting this population up into aces and not aces. And you're looking at the aces and thinking to yourselves, well, you know, I could draw zero of those, I could draw one of those, two of those, three of those, or four of those. Okay, and four choose two by definition is four factorial divided by two factorial, two factorial, which isn't too bad to break up, right? This is just four times three times two factorial divided by two times two factorial. Then the two factorials kind of cancel. Four times three divided by two is six. So the number of ways that that could happen is six. And you could probably count them out and just figure that out too, right? So there's, there's an ace of hearts, there's an ace of diamonds, there's an ace of clubs, there's an ace of spades. How many different ways are there to draw two of those? Okay, so think about that. You could probably list out the different possibilities. Okay, now, as far as the total number of possible ways that you could draw two cards, right, because a trial, you're drawing two cards and the event is specifically that those two, that the two cards are both aces. Well, in that instance, we're taking 52 cards, right? Because you're just drawing two cards. It could be any of the 52. And from that 52, we are choosing two of them. Okay, so that's going to be 52 factorial divided by two factorial times 50 factorial. Okay, which is going to be 52 times 51 times 50 factorial all divided by two times 50 factorial. 50 factorials cancel. We're left with 52 times 51 uh, divided by two, which ends up being 1326. All right. Another way of thinking about this is if you think about it, if you're drawing two cards. There are going to be 52 possibilities for the first time. Okay, so this is this is the first card you draw and this is the second card. There are going to be 52 possibilities for the first one and 51 possibilities for the second one. So the total number of ways to draw the cards would be 52 times 51, but it's going to be equivalent if you get a 3 and a 10 and a 10 and a 3. So since the order doesn't matter for those two cards, you have to divide it by two because there are going to be twice as many possibilities here if the order matters. Okay, so cut it in half and then you get the uh, the, the number of, of subpopulations of two cards from a deck of 52. Okay. All right, so then we remember the general probability formula. We get that the probability of A occurring is number of ways A can occur divided by the total number n. So we get six over 1326, which is about one in 221. 
which tracks, right? It's not very likely at all. It's going to be far less than 1%. Okay, let's do one more example. All right, so this last example of the chapter says, what is the probability that each of four bridge players holds an ace? Okay, so I'm not assuming that you know how the game of bridge works, but the idea is that you have a table and you and your partner are sitting across from each other and then the opponent and their partner are sitting across from each other like that. And then the cards are distributed evenly so that this person is 13, this person is 13, this person is 13, and this person is 18. So this is kind of how the bridge is set up. I don't actually know the specifics of playing bridge. I've never played bridge before, but this is kind of how it's set up. And I don't need to know how to play bridge to answer this question because the event A is that each person holds one ace. So each of four players that both have that each have 13 cards has exactly one ace. Okay, so let's start off by listing the total number of possible outcomes in this. And the way that I think about this is partitioning. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and partition the total of 52 cards into four subpopulations. So we have 13, 13, 13, and 13. And then this is pretty easy. So we have by theorem 1.4, the number of ways that you can partition 52 cards into four groups of 13 is going to be 52 factorial, all divided by 13 factorial, 13 factorial, 13 factorial, 13 factorial, which is the same as 52 factorial divided by 13 factorial to the fourth power. Okay, so that's, that's the total number of, of outcomes of a, a bridge setup. Now, how many different ways can A occur? Well, that one's gonna take a little bit of thought. But the idea is I can still kind of draw a picture, right? And this picture is gonna look something like this. Where we have 12 cards that aren't aces. And then we also have that each person has an ace. Okay, so there are gonna be two aspects to the number of ways that A can occur that we need to take into account. So the number of ways A can happen is going to be 48 factorial divided by 12 factorial, 12 factorial, 12 factorial, 12 factorial. This gives us the number of ways that we can take the non-aces and partition them into four equal groups. So we're excluding the aces right now. Okay, so I'm taking I'm taking the four aces and I am just those those are my aces right now. So before any of this, my setup is just 48 total cards that I'm distributing among four equal groups. So each person gets 12 not aces. Okay? But then I need to multiply this by the number of ways number of ways to give each person one ace, okay? So, to find this, that's not gonna be so bad, okay? All we need to do is we have four people and we have four aces. Now the first person, so this is, this is the first person, the second person, third person, and the fourth person. The first person, they have four options for the aces, right? So they get four. But then there's one less ace, 
So the second person is going to have three different options. Third person's gonna have two options and the fourth person's gonna have one option. Well, that's just four factorial. Okay. So we get that the number of ways that A can, a can occur is 48 factorial divided by 12 factorial to the fourth times four factorial. Okay, great. So now we have the number of ways A can occur and we have the total number of ways. So we can combine them with the probability formula. And we get that the probability that A can occur, right, it's this fraction, is going to be 48 factorial, four factorial over 12 factorial to the fourth power, divided by 52 factorial divided by 13 factorial to the fourth power. And it's at this point that you might think, well, okay, I might need a calculator for this. Well, we can actually simplify this one, not without too much trouble. The first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna rewrite 13 factorial. I'm gonna rewrite, thir I'm gonna rewrite that as, so note that, you know, 13 factorial is gonna be the same as 13 times 12 factorial. Okay, so that means that if you take 13 factorial to the fourth power, you're gonna get 13 to the fourth power times 12 factorial to the fourth power. The reason I wrote it like that is because now this 12 factorial to the fourth is gonna cancel with that 12 factorial to the fourth. Okay, so really we can write this as 48 factorial, four factorial over 12 factorial to the fourth, divided by 52 factorial divided by this quantity, just 13 to the fourth, and then 12 factorial to the fourth. Okay, great, so these cancel. Okay, now I can rewrite this as, let's see. I'm gonna go ahead and flip the fractions. So we're gonna have, let's see, 48 factorial, I have room on this page. It's going to be equal to, yes, 48 factorial, times four factorial, which is 24. Okay, this is gonna flip upwards, which I guess I can just show that. So we're gonna multiply by the reciprocal of this fraction. Okay, and then I can kind of rewrite the denominator, right, because 52 factorial Recall is just 52. So this is just 52 times 51 times 50 times 49 times 48 factorial. Okay, so this is going to be 48 factorial times 24 times 13 to the fourth, all divided by 52 times 51 times 50 times 49 times 48 factorial. Now all the factorials cancel. Okay, and then we're left with this junk. <laughs> and that junk, you can type in your calculator. Okay, it's just the factorials sometimes give two large numbers, and in this case, we were able to uh, simplify it them completely. Okay, so that's our answer. Now, what happens when you can't simplify the factorials? What happens? Well, it turns out that for anything 70 or above factorial, a regular calculator isn't gonna be able to do that because anything over 99 digits, your calculator just checks out and says, nope, can't do that. So 
there's actually a formula that allows you to approximate larger factorials. And I might make a, a miniature, like mini lecture on this formula because it's very useful in thermodynamics and data science. Okay, so for large N, we get that N factorial can be approximated, so is on the order of the square root of two pi N times n to the n times e to the minus n, which doesn't look that much better, but it actually is, because you can take the natural log of this and simplify things pretty greatly. Just a quick little comment. This is called, this is called, this is called Sterling's formula or Sterling's approximation. And the reason that I wanted to comment that is there is another mathematician, I can't remember who it was, that came up with, with the majority of this formula. All Sterling did was come up with this factor of the square root of two pi. And yet the entire formula or approximation is named after him. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. The next video we might explore this just a little bit more and then we're gonna conclude chapter one. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great rest of your day.